Chapter 5. Undoing Rigid Radicalism, Activating Joy. Quote, how does one keep from being fascist, even, especially, when one believes oneself to be a revolutionary militant? How do we rid our speech and our acts, our hearts and our pleasures, of fascism? How do we ferret out the fascism that is ingrained in our behavior? End quote. Michel Foucault. Three Stories of Rigid Radicalism We want to share three stories about some of the origins of rigid, of rigid radicalism, along with the ways it is constantly being undone through people's capacity for joy in the formulation of common notions. We focus on three overlapping sources, ideology, morality, and paranoid reading. The story of ideology begins in currents of Marxism-Leninism that have animated movements throughout the 20th century. But the problem is broader than Leninist vanguardism. It is ideology as such, and the ways that ideological thinking nurtures fixed answers, certainties, and sectarianism. In any movement, ideological rigidity is only one tendency among others, and it is being challenged by currents that are relatively non-ideological. Whether explicit or not, non-ideological ways of moving and relating recover space for experimentation, and they tend to privilege relationships and feeling over dogmatic principles. A second story begins with Christian morality and its penchants for creating sinners and saints and for inducing guilt and fear. Rigid radicalism is stoked by moralism that attempts to root out any shred of complicity with empire, and in the process it often erases complexity and animates self-righteousness. At the same time, people are undoing this in a multiplicity of ways, including through ethical attunement to their own situations and by making space for all kinds of responses that escape the grip of moralism. Finally, the story of paranoid reading is traced back to schooling and the way that students are taught to internalize constant evaluation. Detached from the immediacy of life, measuring everything in relation to fixed standards, it becomes possible to find inadequacies everywhere. When these tendencies take over, there is no space for celebration or surprise. At the same time, we point to some of the ways that this is being undone. Not by abandoning critique, but by recovering complementary capacities to explore potential and encounter new things. Ideology, the militant diagram. Quote, either you respect people's capacities to think for themselves, to gather themselves, to creatively devise their own best ways to make decisions, to be accountable, to relate, problem solve, break down isolation, and commune in a thousand different ways, or you disrespect them. You disrespect all of us. End quote. Ashanti Alston. A major force that has contributed to rigid radicalism is rigid ideology and its tendency to generate certainties and fixed answers that close off the potential for experimentation. Alongside the Marxist critique of capitalist ideology was an aspiration to replace it with a revolutionary, anti-capitalist ideology. It was thought that revolution required a unified consciousness among proletarians. They needed to be taught that, that it was in their interest to overthrow capitalism. The revolutionary vanguard was tasked with developing and disseminating this ideology, and with everything in life subordinated to the goal of revolution, everyone and everything could be treated instrumentally as a means of the seizure of state power and the end of capitalism. The philosopher Nick Thoburn links this revolutionary anti-capitalist ideology to what he calls a quote-unquote militant diagram, a persistent, effective, and ideological tendency that first emerged through Bolshevism and Leninism. It was later expressed in movements throughout the 20th century, from third world national liberation struggles to socialist formations in North America and Europe, to black power in the 1960s and 70s. According to Colectivo Situaciones, a militant research group in Argentina, this figure of militancy is always, quote, setting out the party line, unquote. Quote, keeping for himself a knowledge of what ought to happen in the situation, which he always approaches from outside, an instrumental and transitive way. Situations have value as moments of a general strategy that encompasses them, because his fidelity is, above all, ideological and pre-exists all situations." End quote. The notion of a correct party line took different forms among different movements, but the basic, hierarchical, rigid structure was the same. 
a certain privileged group would help usher in the revolution through a correct interpretation of theory and the unfolding of history. Despite joyful transformations and in insurrectionary openings, tendencies towards vanguardism and rigid ideology often led groups towards isolation and stagnation. Among, in, among many other groups, these tendencies can be seen in the U.S.-based Weather Underground, a militant, white, anti-imperialist group active during the 1970s. They are best known for their series of bombings targeting public infrastructure and monuments, conducted in an attempt to wake up white Americans to realities of U.S. imperialism, such as the government's slaughter of Vietnamese people and its assassination of Black Panthers. They also adopted Mao's self-criticism in order to ferret out any trace of the dominant ideology within their group. Criticism sessions, which could last for hours or even days, involve members discussing weaknesses, tactical mistakes, emotional investments, preparedness for violence, and even sexual proclivities, in an effort to shed all attachments to the dominant order and induce a revolutionary way of being. Even the most ruthless criti criticism could be justified as part of this process, and the Weather Underground developed a whole regimen of practices designed to purify themselves of any trace of dominant ideology, cobbled with constant injunctions towards what they saw as the most militant forms of action possible. While their tactics were controversial, they were also widely supported at the time, and the Weather Underground was only one of the many groups that were bombing and sabotaging corporate and government infrastructure. What we are interested in getting at is not particular tactics nor something specific to underground groups, but the way that certain tendencies of thought, action, and feeling can congeal into stifling patterns. As former Weather Underground member Bernadine Dorn writes, quote, Weather succumbed to dogma, arrogance, and certainty. We were not alone. There was recovery and amends that, were st that are still underway. But the perceived necessity to have answers to everything and to struggle endlessly resulted in ungenerous and damaging leadership, harm to great comrades, and wretched behavior." End quote. As Bill Ayers, another former member, explains, the attempt to escape completely from a culture of white supremacy and capitalist conformity enforced an intense alternative orthodoxy, quote, it was fanatical obedience. We militant nonconformists suddenly tripping over one another to be exactly alike, following the sticky rolls of congealed idealism. I cannot reproduce the stifling atmosphere that overpowered us. Events came together with the gentleness of an impreding train wreck, and there was the sad sensation of waiting for impact." End quote. Though the goal was to create revolutionary forms of organization capable of overthrowing the U.S. government, their ideological rigidity and norms of relentless self-sacrifice paradoxically isolate them further and further from the quote-unquote masses that they sought to mobilize. When we interviewed him, Gustavo Esteva discussed his own experience of Marxist-Leninist militancy in Latin America during this time. Quote, in the 60s, when I became associated with a group in the process of organizing a guerrilla group in Mexico whose members were assuming that they were already the vanguard of the proletariat because they had the revolutionary program, I was fully immersed in what we now call sad militancy. Our quote-unquote program was evidently an intellectual construction in the Leninist tradition. We, all, we had already our criticism of Stalinism, etc., but we were still in the tradition of trying to seize power of the state for a revolution from the top down through social engineering. We were thus preparing ourselves through military training, etc., and organizing. Of course, there were moments or conditions of joy, laughter, intensified emotion, exhilaration. The environment of conspiracy and clandestinity and the shared ideology shaped real camaraderie and episodes full of joy. But it was clear that the experience itself was pure sad militancy, full of creating boundaries, making distinctions, comparing, making plans, and so on. How the whole experience ended makes the point better than any of those stories. One of our leaders killed the other leader because of a woman. The episode evidenced for us the kind of violence we were accumulating in ourselves and wanted to impose on the whole society. In the military training for an army, for an army or a guerrilla, to learn how to use a weapon is pretty easy. What is difficult is to learn to kill someone in cold blood, as someone like you, that did nothing personal against you. Nothing sadder than that." End quote. 
The experience of the Weather Underground and Esteva both make it clear that these ideological tendencies are not just about ideas. They also contain their own pleasures and highs, induced in part by the sense of being clandestine and more aware than the quote-unquote masses. Ideology is not simply rigid and cold, it can include a warm sense of belonging and camaraderie among its adherents. This tendency is percolated into contemporary movements and groups, including those that are not directly influenced by Marxism, Leninism, or Maoin. Nick Thoburn suggests, quote, It is a central paradox of militancy that as an organization constitutes itself as a unified body, it tends to become closed to the outside, to the non-militant, to those who would be the basis of any mass movement. Indeed, to the degree that the militant body conceives of itself as having discovered the correct revolutionary principle and establishes the center of activity on adherence to this principle, it has a tendency to develop hostility to those who fall short of its standard. End quote. As militant rigidity increases, a gap widens between the group and its outside, but a single unified marxism leninism has existed only as a dream. In reality, there has been a prol proliferation of sectarian commitments to various ideologies, including strains of Marxism, anarchism, socialism, and so on. Ideological thinking is not necessarily something escaped through more and better thinking. For Esteva, one of the things that fundamentally destabilized the strictures of his Leninism was his joyful encounter with others and their confidence in their own capacities to respond to problems with conviviality. Quote, the joy of living, the passion for fiestas, the capacity to express emotions, the social climate that I found at the grassroots in villages and barrios, in the midst of extreme misery, began to change my attitudes. My participation in different kinds of peasant and urban marginal movements gave me a radically different approach. The break point was perhaps the explosion of autonomy and self-organization after the earthquake in Mexico City in 1985. It became for me a life-changing experience. The victims of the earthquake were suffering all kinds of hardships. They had lost friends and relatives, their homes, their possessions, almost everything. Their convivial reconstruction of their lives and culture would not have been possible without the amazing passion for living they showed at every moment. Such passion had a very powerful political expressions and was the seed for amazing social movements. In the following years, the balance of forces changed in Mexico City, already a monstrous settlement of 15 million people. There was a radical contrast between the guerrilla and these movements. The very notion of militancy changed in me. It was no longer associated with an organization, a party, an ideology, and even less a war. It was an act of love." End quote. To experience joy in this way is not simply to feel good, but also to be transformed. Esteva's experience with the grassroots led him to censor conviviality and joy in his work, and in and his life, while continuing to be involved with and support militant movements, including the Zapatistas and the insurrectionary uprisings in Oaxaca. For us, this shows that militancy is always about more than tactics or combativeness. It is tied to questions of affect, how movements enable people to grow their own capacities and become new people, or don't. Mar Marina Citrin consistently foregrounds affect in her own work with horizontalist movements in Argentina, and when we interviewed her for this book, she talked about her experience with the different affect affective spaces created by groups she has been involved with. Quote, On a basic level, the space a group or movement creates from the beginning is key. The tone and openness, or not, makes a big difference if one wants to focus on new relationships with one another. Along these same lines, ideological rigidity and hierarchies and ideas, formal and informal, create a closed and eventually nasty space for those not ascribing to the ideology or a part of the clique. People, who do, not s people do not stay in movements that are organized in this way, or if they do it is with a sort of obedience that is not transformative and instead creates versions of the same power and hierarchy. My early organizing experiences were fortunately with anti-racist and later Central American solidarity movements with people who had been a part of the civil rights and later anti-nuclear movements, so who had a focus, at least in part, on social relationships and democracy. Later, however, when I decided I needed to be a part of a revolutionary group that was organizing against capitalism as a whole, well, I found myself in a few different centrist socialist groups, which are really soul-deadening. It was all about ideology and guilt. One could never do enough and could never know enough or quote enough of who or quote enough of whomever was the revolutionary of the day. James Cannon, Tony Cliff, etc. 
etc. It was also politically all about the end and not the day-to-day. -day. That even included women, which one would think, after the radical feminist movement, that these groups would get their relationships have to change now. But no, it was all about the future free society we'll have to work for, accepting relationships as they are, pretty much. I later came around some anarchist groups, thinking that they would be more open and focused on the day-to-day, -day, as, as that is what I had read from the theory, but found the rigidity around identity too harsh, and since I was not squatting or dressing a certain way, I was kept at arm's length, which was fine since I felt too rejected to try very hard." End quote. Citrin's account makes it clear that rigid radicalism does not stem from one ideology or group in particular. Marxism Leninism has lost its grip on many movements, and accounts of such groups can sound strange and distant today. In North America, at least, the dream of a revolutionary seizure of state powers lost a lot of its force, but in many cases, Marxist ideology has been superseded by other ideological closures and sectarian tendencies. Currents of anarchism can be just as hostile and ideologically rigid. Ideology and Anarchism Anarchism is a vibrant and complex tradition. At their most joyful, anarchist currents support common notions such as mutual aid, autonomy, direct action, and solidarity, while refusing ideological closures. At the same time, however, anarchists have always grappled with ideology. The early 20th century anarchist feminists, Emma Goldman, shared this experience in her autobiography. Quote, At the dances, I was one of the most untiring and gayest. One evening, a cousin of Sasha, a young boy took me aside. With a grave face, as if he were about to announce the death of a dear comrade, he whispered to me that it did not behoove an agitator to dance, certainly not with such reckless abandon anyway. It was undignified for one who was on the way to become a force in the anarchist movement. My frivolity could only hurt the cause. I grew furious at the impudent interference of the boy. I told him to mind his own business. I was tired of having the cause constantly thrown into my face. I do not believe a cause which stood for a beautiful ideal, for anarchism, for release and freedom from conventions and prejudice, should demand the denial of life and joy. I insisted that our cause could not expect me to become a nun and that the movement should not be turned into a cloister. If it meant that, I did not want it. Quote, I want freedom, the right to self-expression, everybody's right to beautiful, radiant things, unquote. Anarchism meant that to me, and I will live it in spite of the whole world. Prisons, persecution, everything. Yes, even in spite of the condemnation of my own comrades, I would live my beautiful ideal. End quote. Since Goldman wrote about this a century ago, this kind of policing has continued in a new and different ways. While Maoism and Leninism were ascendant in radical politics, it took the form of maintaining an explicit party line. With the decline of these ideologies, rigid radicalism has shapeshifted into new forms. One of the ideological tendencies animating anarchist and anti-authoritarian spaces is what Amory Starr calls quote-unquote grumpy warrior cool. Rather than the militant conformity of Marxist-Leninism, grumpy warrior cool manifests as an ideology of individualistic anti-conformity and anti-vanguardism. Starr gives a, gives a polemical example of the quote-unquote manarchist whose quote-unquote freedom to do whatever he wants ends up reinforcing individualism, whiteness, and patriarchy. Quote, I'm going to stink, I'm going in there even though I'm contagious, I'm going to bring my barking dog, I have the right to do whatever the fuck I want, and people just have to deal with it, and I'm going to call this cultural diversity. Meanwhile, other folks around are feeling like another white guy is doing whatever the fuck he wants. End quote. She suggests that privileging individual freedom is ideological because it tends to force out potentials for connection, and curiosity, and a sense of collective responsibility. In Starr's analysis, there are some cont continuities between Gumpery Warrior Cool and, order and earlier ideological forms. Norms of fearlessness, self-sacrifice, and bravery, she argues, can end up eliminating space to express hesitation or fear. These intimate reflections can be transformative, but they remain hidden because it is too difficult to voice them in a climate where fearlessness is the ideal. Similarly, Starr names quote-unquote smart radicalism as a fundamental premise of white, anti-authoritarian organizing of grumpy warrior coal. A commitment to radical principles and theories, a quote-unquote correct interpretation of them, and the assumption that this correctness will avoid mistakes. Forced out by these tendencies are friendliness, comfort, generosity, and curiosity. Outsiders are viewed with, cooled, with cool suspicion. 
These stories are not meant as a criticism of anarchism or Marxism as a whole. We are trying to locate ideological tendencies within these complex and varied traditions. At its best, anarchism has enabled the refusal of fixed ideologies in favor of experimentation, openness, autonomy, and a proliferation of different struggles and forms of life. As Scott Crow writes, quote, an abundance of literature has been written about anarchism over the last hundred years. How is it organized? What could it look like? What are examples of it in practice? There are also complex critiques and analyses of it, but for me, anarchism is just a point of reference, a descriptive word to get one's bearings for starting conversations that move to action. It describes an opening up of possibilities for changing ourselves and our communities. It describes a set of guiding principles and ideas, serious and playful at once, not a rigid ideology. Not a rigid ideology. End quote. We think this can of anarchism as a point of reference and an evolving set of questions can help ward off the crystallization of fixed ideology. Crow further suggests that anarchism is animated by trust in people's ability to solve their own problems and to take collective responsibility rather than a prescription for how they should do it. This is the kind of anarchism we are after, a non-ideological sensibility that nurtures trust in people's capacity to care for each other and to be responsive, inventive, and militant. The limits of ideology. In this sense, Ashanti Alston suggests that the problem is not about displacing Marxism, Leninism, or Maoism with an anarchist ideology. The problem is ideology as such, and all the baggage that comes with it. Quote, ideology comes out of having a set of answers for something. So even for me with my anarchism, I don't think it's classical. I don't call myself an anarcho-communist or any of the others. There's definitely anarchism that's open to being in tune with always changing realities. For me, anarcho-communists got good points about certain things. Primitivists have good points about certain things. Them two don't get along, but I get something from both of them. I like some aspects of anarcho-individualism and Tolstoy's spiritualism. For most of my folks, my people are Christians or Muslims and increasingly Yoruba, Kemetic, and other African religions that they're recovering and using. I don't want to be categorized as a particular school because I know if I do, the world I would hope to be created won't have room for all kinds of tendencies of anarchism, or all kinds of tendencies of people living their lives according to their own terms." End quote. From this perspective, ideology is a screen that limits the possibility of open-ended encounters where mutual learning and transformation can take place. Its inducement of conformity tends towards closed, stagnant little enclaves. Ideological and sectarian tendencies offer the comfort of being able to pin things down, the pleasure of feeling that one is above or ahead of others, and the somber ability to sort new encounters into neat categories so that one is never too unsettled or affected by anything. Undoing ideology. Rather than becoming rooted in a single current, in a single ideological current, Alston points out to the potential of affirming the most enabling parts of a multiplicity of currents. Similarly, when we interviewed Richard Day, he made a distinction between an ideological approach and an ethical one, like Alston's. Day speaking. If someone is working ideologically, they will have a pat answer to any question that might be asked without having to do much in the way of thinking or analysis. If you ask a liberal about smashing bank windows in a protest, they will probably say it's violent and bad. If you ask an anarchist, they will probably say it's not violent, it's destruction of stolen property, and quite a valid thing to do. This is similar to working morally, and that you need only consult a tablet, ask a functionary such as a priest, and they will tell you what to do and not do. In a critical, analytic, ethical way of relating, it is impossible to know what one might think or feel ahead of time. That will be contingent upon many circumstances of the situation. There is likely to be much more complexity, much more nuance, less dogmatism, certainty, and purity. In general, I think it's as safe to associate ideological ways of relating with rigid radicalism, and that's why you find that so many people all over the world who are actually involved in the most powerful social movements and upheavals tend to steer away from ideology and orient more toward more to shared values, practices, and goals. Nick and Carla speaking. And not being ideological means being uncertain as well, right? Day speaking. Yeah, working non-ideologically definitely involves an element of openness, of vulnerability, not only at the level of emotion, but at the level of thought and of political relationships. There's a certain sort of safety in having an answer to every 
for everything. As we insisted earlier, ethics here does not mean an individualized set of fixed principles, as in consumer ethics or personal ethics, but instead a capacity to be attuned to the situation, to be immersed in it, and to create something emergent out of the existing conditions. Alston speaks the power and potential of working across difference in ways that respect where people are coming from. Quote, different consciousnesses can come from different places, and we can figure out the dialogue how to create a way forward that respects us all, that respects the different worlds that we come from. So for me, if that happened back then in 1970, where would we have been right now? And for Mir, and for me, that's such a better way to go, because for the queer community or the Yoruba community that may exist in Brooklyn, what's best for them? Whether one is a small geographical community, or tied to their ethnicity, or dealing with a lifestyle, we should just be open to come together and see how we can do this di in a different kind of way. That's the challenge." End quote. This is the ethics of encounter. Instead of asking whether we or they are inherently radical, revolutionary, or anarchist, an ethical approach asks questions about how we aff affect each other, what new encounters become possible, and what we can do together. None of the answers to these questions can be known in advance. They can only be asked as part of an open-ended, unfolding experiment as markers in an always changing world, in which we figure things out along the way. As the anarchist collective crime think writes, quote, if the hallmark of ideology is that it begins from an answer or a conceptual framework and attempts to work backwards from there, then one way to resist ideology is to start from questions rather than answers. That is to say, when we intervene in, a social, in social conflicts, doing so in order to assert questions rather than conclusions. What is it that brings us together and defines movement, if not questions? Answers can alienate or stupefy, but questions seduce. Once enamored of a question, people will fight their whole lives to answer it. Questions precede answers and outlast them. Every answer only perpetuates the, the question that begot it." End quote. We should add that an important complement to asking questions is being able to listen sincerely to responses and to those with altogether different questions. The power of questions comes from people being able to respond and hear each other in new ways. It comes from hanging on to the uncertainties they generate and the new potential that comes along with them. To undo ideology is not as straightforward as taking off a pair of glasses to see the world differently. To ward off ideology is not to finally is not not only to see clearly, but to be disoriented, allowing things to emerge in their murkiness and complexity. It might mean seeing and feeling more, off, more but often vaguely, like flickers in one's peripheral vision or strange sensations that defy familiar categories and emotions. It is, an un, it is an undoing of oneself, cutting across the grain of habits and attachments. To step, to step out of an inherited ideology can be joyful and painful. Morality, Fear, and Ethical Attunement The Christian Origins of Morality Quote, There is perhaps no phenomenon which contains so much destructive feeling as moral indignation, which permits envy or hate to be acted out under the guise of virtue. End quote. Eric Fromm There is a second story, related and overlapping but distinct. Rigid radicalism can be traced to a Christian current of moralism, with its penchants for fear and hostility to a sinful world. Even within Christianity, this was not the only current. It has always also been a site of transformation and revolt. But the dominant form of Christianity over centuries in Europe was a colonizing force seeking to crush its own rebellious currents within and to convert or annihilate the rest of the world. To be successful, the church did not merely command obedience. Through practices like confession, it, saw, it taught its subjects to internalize their own sinfulness, guilt, and inadequacy. This Christian subjectivity is one based in resentment of excess and transformation, bent on spreading guilt and shame. Inspired in part by his reading of Spinoza, Friedrich Nietzsche showed how Christian morality sacralized meekness and submission, turning powerlessness into a mark of blessedness. His concept of resentment names the nurturance of a deep-seated hatred and fear of others, and of one's own sinful desires, based on a stultifying morality. Over the last several centuries, 
Guilt and shame have undergone a secular conversion, rejecting the church for its superstition while embracing resentment. This secular subject hates the church but loves its poison. The affective structures of lack, guilt, fear, and purism remains intact. Morality and Movement Quote, Don't be in such a hurry to condemn a person because he doesn't do what you do or think as you think or as fast. There was a time when you didn't know what you know today. End quote. Malcolm X Liberal morality seeps into movements in the form of incessant regulation and pacification of struggles. It replaces the transformative power of dignity with moral indignation and its tendencies of shame and self-righteousness. It pathologizes anger, hatred, and destruction, turning nonviolence into a moral imperative rather than a tactic. This is the morality of the cop who tells you to calm down with one hand on his gun, the sympathizer whose quote-unquote support for you evaporates as soon as things become quote-unquote violent, the citizen who says you had better vote or you can't complain. People in struggle are constantly told about the quote-unquote correct way of conducting themselves if they want to be respected and heard. The liberal morality of whiteness converts racism and sexism into matters of individual prejudice. Conversations about violence and oppression are constantly, di constantly derailed by individual emotions and the erasure of power relations where white feelings matter more than black lives. Under the stifling weight of liberal morality, anti-liberal morality has grown in reaction. The targets and the enemies change, but the structure remains, and radical morality can reach new heights of corrosive self-righteousness and punishment. From this perspective, things are always in danger of becoming infected or diluted by liberalism. Liberal or oppressive sentiments must be attacked wherever they are detected. Callouts and radical takedowns proliferate. Indignation grows, everything is corrupt and tainted, nothing is as it should be. This, quote, as it should be, unquote, is no longer determined by Christian priests or politicians and good citizens, but by a radical certainty that one is on the right side of a moral drama between good and evil. Like the old Christian morality, new forms of moralism subsist on the evils they decry. To remain pious, the priest must reveal new sins. This can surface as an incessant search for oppression and a ceaseless attack on anyone who is found guilty, including oneself, through new forms of confession, trials, and punishments. The new other is the not radical enough, the liberal, the perpetrator, the oppressor. A number of our interlocutors have pointed out how these moralistic tendencies towards punishment can end up excluding many of those, many of those who are supposed to be centered by anti-oppressive practices. Poor people, people without formal education, and others who haven't been exposed to the ever-evolving language of radical communities. In a compassionate way, Kelsey Shamsi shares their experience with call-out culture and language policing upon being introduced to radical communities. Quote, When I came out as queer in Montreal, I started to find accurate words to describe how I felt about the world. Even though this skill was my entry into more political communities, it's I still felt incredibly judged. It was like an ultra-heightened experience of not being allowed in the cool kid club in high school, but with all new rules that I had not learned and that no one took the time to explain to me. The language I grew up with could no longer be applied and would sometimes get me kicked out of social settings. My entire experience of growing up was judged and I felt totally isolated in trying to figure out why. As I've gotten older, I've figured out the quote-unquote right way to navigate in these communities by learning language protocol and radical terminology while dropping the offensive and oppressive slang. I don't disagree with changing language to support systems we care about. I do disagree with judging people for not knowing the rules, especially since radicals are often organizing in favor of marginalized communities who are generally not aware of these rules. If I wanted to fill out a form to describe my identity, I could check a bunch of boxes that would make my experience worth standing up for. Queer, trans, person of color, former sex trade worker. Ironically, the biggest advocates for people like me, the people ready to throw down stats about harm reduction in youth, gender queer folks, and the vulnerable people in society. Many of them had no patience for me. I came into their communities looking for support, friends, and directions. I came having left abusive and sexually manipulative partners. I came in hella lost, unaware, and not very educated. 
but I came in agreement with their political perspectives because I knew society was fucked from the time I was 12, maybe even younger. In high school, while other kids wrote about teen heartbreak, I wrote about injustices I saw everywhere. I came into these radical communities wanting to make change, but all my habits and the language I had learned I had learned to protect myself with got me in shit." End quote. Chomsky's sort story gets at a common experience in radical milieus, in which language and conduct are intensely scrutinized, and those who fail are often forced out. Far from arbitrary, these rules are often earnest attempts to root out oppressive behaviors with the aspiration of creating spaces where everyday habits and language are less laden with structural violence. In a world where white supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, and other forms of violence are incessant, the, de- the desire to create spaces that feel a little safer makes a lot of sense. Yet as Chomsky explains, they can become stifling and exclusionary in the, afor- in the enforcement of a quote-unquote right way of being. What reinforces rigid radicalism, we think, is not the attempt to change language or behavior, but the way these attempts can be subsumed by moralism and reinforce shame, blame, punishment, and guilt. Morality is dangerous not only because it can reinforce oppression, but also because it can divorce people from their own power. People are reduced to their statements, becoming symptoms or examples of violence rather than complex and changing beings. Moral indignation can promote stagnation encouraging complaints and condemnations that lead nowhere. The desire to be morally right can get in the way of here and now transformation. Warding off morality with common notions. Squeezed out by morality, we think, are common notions, ethical, responsive ways of relating that are attuned to the complexities of each situation and capable of supporting collective transformation. When morality takes over, common notions are converted into rigid principles or practices that can no longer be questioned. This can be seen in what has become known as, quote, call-out culture, unquote. In many radical milieus, the prevalence of publicly attacking certain statements or behaviors is oppressive. As Toronto-based writer Assam Admod writes, quote, What makes call-out culture so toxic is not necessarily its frequency so much as the nature and performance of the call-out itself. Especially in online venues like Twitter and Facebook, calling someone out isn't just a private interaction between two individuals. It's a public performance where people can demonstrate their wit or how pure their politics are. Indeed, it can feel like the performance itself is more significant than the content of the call-out. Call-out culture can end up mirroring what the prison industrial complex teaches us about crime and punishment. To banish and dispose of individuals rather rather than to engage with them as people with complicated stories and histories. It isn't an exaggeration to say that there is a mild totalitarian undercurrent, not just in call-out culture, but but also in how progressive communities police and define the bounds of who's in and who's out. More often than not, this boundary is constructed through the use of appropriate language and terminology, a language and terminology that are forever shifting and almost impossible to keep up with. In such a context, it is impossible not to fail at least some of the time. End quote. Through its toxic performance, call-out culture can activate and intensify a climate of fear, shame, and self-righteousness. It is important to note that none of the voices we are bringing into this chapter are suggesting that calling people out, naming oppression, or creating boundaries is wrong. Because oppression is so pervasive, and people's responses to it are so heavily policed and pathologized, these can be hard conversations to have. We want to suggest that this conversation is already being had in ways that are more open, transformative, and ethical than what what morality allows for. Ethical attunement disrupts universalizing, moralizing frameworks that would dictate how people deal with oppression. It enables exploration, collective questioning, and responsiveness that is tuned to the situation at hand. In a widely circulated article entitled Calling In, a Less Disposable Way of Holding Each Other Accountable, Nyok Lon Tran explains how calling out can feed into destructive ways of relating. Quote, Most of us know the drill. Someone says something that supports the oppression of another community, the red flag pops up, and someone swoops in to call them out. But what happens when that someone is a person we know and love? What happens when we, are, when we ourselves are that, pers- are that someone? And what does it mean for our work to rely on how we have been programmed to punish people for their mistakes? 
I'll be the first person and the, and the last person to say that anger is valid. Mistakes are mistakes, they deepen the wounds we carry. I know that for me, when these mistakes are committed by people who I am in community with, it hurts even more. But these are people I care deeply about and want to see on the other side of the hurt, pain, and trauma. I am willing to offer compassion and patience as a way to build the road as we are, take, uh, we are taking what I've never seen before." End quote. Whereas morality tends towards universal answers, certainties, and binary thinking, Tron requires recovers space for openness and uncertainty in the concept of calling in, pointing to the ways that people are support are supporting each other in naming harm and violence and undoing it together. Tron goes on to say that calling in is not about being soft or nice, but instead about tuning into the complexities and relationships of each situation when dealing with harm and mistakes. Quote, I don't propose practicing calling in in opposition to calling out. I don't think that our work has room for binary thinking and action. However, I do think that it's possible to have multiple tools, strategies, and methods existing simultaneously. It's about being strategic, weighing the stakes, and figuring out what we're trying to build and how we are do going to do it together. In this sense, or end quote, in this sense, calling in can be understood as a common notion not a fixed way of being, or even a recommendation, but a practice that can be developed collectively with transformative eff effects and shared with caution. It is resonant with other common notions that have developed elsewhere, such as leaning in and meeting people where they're at. It is an invitation to tune into specificities and relationships in each situation, rather than falling back on the prescriptions and justifications of morality. Ethical attunement might include firm boundaries and aggressive callouts. It might include attunement to one's own exhaustion, resulting in refusal to engage at all. We find that ethical attunement thrives most as a collective process of experimentation. Like the concepts of infinite responsibility and emergent trust, it is sustained through a willingness to make mistakes and allow others to make them, rather than trying to avoid being wrong. It's ultimately about the shared capacity to take care of each other in the face of pain, hurt, and violence. There is always the risk of a concept like calling in being recaptured by liberal morality, adding a new set of norms to govern the conduct of people who are already dealing with systemic oppression. Be nice, take care of people, don't get so angry. Therefore, we want to be unequivocal, especially as white people, that we are not trying to establish new norms of contact for conversations about oppression or to suggest that callouts are wrong or counterproductive. Morality can prop up white fragility, white guilt, savor complexes, and other moves to innocence. It can enforce the idea that there is some duty to have these conversations over and over, extracting emotional labor from colonized people or people of color as if it were an obligation. Liberal morality can hide the white supremacist violence pervading schools, policing, and the prison industrial complex, reducing ra racism to questions of individual guilt and including and inducing defensive reactions from white people. It's not my fault, I'm not racist, I haven't done anything wrong. Morality can sometimes also be behind tendencies to replace innocence with sin enabling white anti-racism that creates barriers to undoing white supremacy. As we, are right, as we are white people, moralism can induce us to loudly proclaim our knowledge that we are racist and to self-righteously call out racism in others. Anti-racist organizer Chris Crass and others have argued that there is a class dimension to this. Quote, For anti-racist work with a middle-class orientation, this then often looks like an overemphasis on changing personal behavior, using correct language, and calling out other people who aren't acting and speaking in the right way. It can lead to a looking down on the communities that you have come from and distancing yourself from your own past by ruthlessly criticizing everyone who acts and talks like you did two weeks ago." End quote. Cross goes on to link these middle-class tendencies to perfectionism and a fear of making mistakes. At the same time, he makes it clear that this is not an attack on the people reproducing these tendencies, but on empire's forms of subjection. Quote, the enemy is capitalism, not middle-class activists, and a middle-class orientation isn't something that only middle-class people can have. It's the orientation that all of us who aren't ruling class are raised to endlessly and exhaustingly strive for. End quote. 
feminism, disability justice, decolonization, black liberation, and other interconnected currents are short-circuiting individualizing moralism with much more complex stories about oppression. Stories about institutionalized white supremacy do not blame individual white people, but they do not let us off the hook either. They reveal the ways that we are participating in a system that stretches far beyond us, and they compel us to discover ways to disrupt that system by supporting anti-racist struggles. They attune us to relationships and histories and deepen responsibility, not the prescription of fixed duties, but by growing capacities to be responsive to a whole range of collectively formulated problems. Common notions are emerging all the time against the grain of moralism. These conversations are already happening in ways that get beyond dichotomies of rightness and wrongness towards more complex questions. This can be seen when people are able to draw out other ways of being with each other, activating collective responses to violence. It can be seen in disruptive tactics of direct action and in the queer, quiet forms of healing and being present with others. It can be seen in the strategic use of privilege and in the ways that people plant seeds and trust others to reach their own conclusions. Transformative responses like these are joyful in the Spinozan sense. They lead not to an increase in happiness, but to an increase in one's capacity to affect and be affected, with all the pain and risk and uncertainty this might entail. Joy is never a duty and never something imposed on other people. We are not saying people should be ethically attuned. We are trying to affirm that joyful transformation is already happening, as an emergent power that undoes moralism and opens up new potentials, sometimes even beautifully. Joy subsists through common notions, which need to be held and tended in order to remain alive. As Ursula K. Le Guin writes in The Lathe of Heaven, quote, Love doesn't just sit there like a stone, it has to be made like bread, remade all the time, made anew. End quote. You're so paranoid, you probably think this section is about you. Black finding, perfectionism, schooling, walking. What follows is a third story about the origins of rigid, of rigid radicalism, guided by these questions. What makes it possible or even predictable for radical spaces and movements to be perceived in terms of their shortcomings? What encourages the suspicion and incessant critique that runs through so many radical milieus? Is there something that makes critique a reflex and a habit that forces out other possibilities? One example is learning to walk. When little kids take their first steps, people around them cheer, rejoice, and celebrate. We take photos, tell friends, and record these moments because we want to share the joy in witnessing the emergence of a new increase in capacity. This kid is learning to walk. But if we take a perfectionist perspective, then why celebrate? The kid won't usually walk for very long, they stumble and fall, and they certainly can't run. But no one says, quote, why are you celebrating? They're not really walking yet. End quote. If the kid learning to walk is just another kid walking, it is no longer something worth celebrating. Those who celebrate are naive or getting a bit carried away. Kids are learning to walk all the time. But in the moment, it doesn't seem naive because we are part of the process of witnessing this kid walk in this way for the very first time. We bring up this example because it seems obvious that it is nonsensical to impose external ideals of walking on little kids who are just learning or to approach the situation with a detached and suspicious stance. It seems obvious, we hope, that a toddler's increase in capacity, those first steps that mark the emergence of something new, is sufficient in itself. It is a joyful moment worth celebrating, not because it's part of some linear process of development, but because it's an emergent power for that kid, palpable to all present in those moments. With this in mind, why is it so difficult sometimes to celebrate small victories or humble increases in collective power and capacity? What makes it so easy to dismiss transformation as too limited? What makes it e so easy to find joy lacking? We see variants of this dynamic happen a lot. Someone celebrates something joyful while, some, while others offer reminders of its insufficiency. We find ourselves doing the same thing sometimes. What allows for the constant imposition of external norms, criteria, and ideas for evaluations? Surely it comes from many different places, but we think part of it can be traced to the way schooling crushes openness to new encounters. 
Most of, us, most of us have been exposed to at least some of this for big chunks of our lives. Schooling replaces curiosity with instruction, memorization, and hierarchical evaluation. We are encouraged to internalize the notion that our worth is connected to our grades, that we are locked in competition with our classmates, and that we are like empty vessels awaiting knowledge. Not long after children learn to walk, they are often stuck in schools and subjected to constant monitoring control and evaluation. In school, new capacities can only be affirmed when they conform to the criteria set out by the institution. That is, when a student has learned a particular thing at the right time in the right way. Curiosity and the discovery of emergent connections need to be crushed in order to create this conformity, and those who refuse or resist are quickly labeled problem children. A need of remedial education, medication, therapy, or punishment. Those who make it through learn to internalize and assess an evaluation by externally imposed standards. By reducing lives to those, these, to these external standards, schooling crushes the capacity for joy. Adults, parents, and other caregivers are tasked with continuing this process outside of school, teaching children to categorize and measure everything, including themselves. There is always someone further along who has done it better and more proficiently. Evaluation works by removing the immediacy of life, or we can sense the unfurling of newness and potential and learn by exploring the world, following our curiosities. Radical perfectionism and paranoid reading. This tendency for constant evaluation and the imposition of external standards has percolated its way into many facets of life under empire. It exists even among radicals. What changes is merely the kind of standards and the mode of evaluation. Is it radical? Is it anarchist? Is it critical? Is it revolutionary? Is it anti-oppressive? How might it become co-opted, complicit, or flawed? What is problematic? What does it fail to do? How limited, ineffective, and short-lived is it? Margaret Kiljoy spoke to us about the ways that these tendencies can pervade anarchist spaces. Quote, well, I think there's a decent bit of spontaneity and not making rules and such going on in radicalism. I see an awful lot less creativity at the moment. Particularly, I see very little creativity from tactical, strategic, and even theoretical analysis. For a bunch of anarchists, we're remarkably uncomfortable with new ideas. If I were to hazard a guess, I would say that happens because we really honed our ability to critique things, but not our ability to embrace things. End quote. Applied incessantly, critique can become a reflex that forces out other capacities. The queer theorist Eve Sedgwick argues that this penchant for constant critique runs through many currents of radical thought, in what she calls paranoid reading. Paranoid reading is based on a stance of suspicion, an attempt to avoid co-optation co or mistakes through constant vigilance. It seeks to ward off bad surprises by ensuring that oppression and violence are already known, or at least anticipated, so that one will not be caught off guard, and so that one can react to the first sign of trouble. The result is that one is always on guard and never surprised. By approaching everything with detached suspicion, one closes off the capacity to be affected in new ways. When we, when we interviewed Richard Day, he suggested that this tendency is linked to being in pain and converting that pain into an incessant search of lo for lack. Quote, In general, I think rigid radicalism is a response to feeling really hurt and fucked up. And the real enemy is the dominant order, but it gets mixed into this big soup so that the enemy becomes each other. It becomes oneself. It's a finding lacking as such. A finding lacking almost everywhere with almost everyone. And when that lack is found, then of course there needs to be some sort of action, which is going to be to tell or force or coerce or get at that lack and try to turn it into a wholeness. So, strangely enough, I'd suggest that rigid radicalism is just driven by desire to heal. And it has exactly the opposite effect, of sundering the self more, of sundering communities more, and so on. End quote. Those of us who regularly find ourselves in pain might find this paradox familiar. Through the constant imposition of external standards, everything can be found lacking, and all kinds of coercive responses can seem justified. An endless cycle ensues, no one and nothing is good enough, and this paranoid stance constantly incapacitates exploration, healing, and affirmation. 
Many of us learn this mode of thought through university or through immersion in radical spaces themselves. We learn to search for, anticipate, and point out the pervasiveness of empire. Even without the sad rigor of the weather underground, we learn to search the bodies, behaviors, and words of others for any shred of complicity. Mick Terje spoke of the, to this tendency, quote, I think as a youth I was really idealistic, and I came to the university context and critical theory where idealism and imagining something better was stamped out as something naive. The only option was to master the hypercritical language myself and one-upping people. I got really good at that. I won all of the political arguments in school, but I was being a shitbag of a militant, tearing everyone down. End quote. By being immersed in paranoid reading, people learn to find themselves and others lacking. Having been quote-unquote educated, one becomes a pedagogue oneself, spreading the word about empire, oppression, and violence, and in the process one tends to position others as naive and ignorant. This is clear in how surprise and curiosity are often infantilized by empire. They are treated as foolish or quote-unquote childish, that is, lacking the educated, rational, civilized, adult capacities of detached evaluation. Paranoid reading and its association with adulthood and rational detachment are transmitted through schooling founded on patriarchal white supremacy. Based on suspicion, perfectionism, and the penchant for finding flaws in ourselves and others, paranoid reading prevents us from being joyfully in touch with the world and with the always already present potential for transformation. Critically, paranoid reading and lack finding have their own effective ecology with their own pleasures and rewards. There can be a sense of satisfaction in being the one who anticipates or exposes inadequacy. There can be a safety and comfort in a paranoid stance because it helps ensure that we already know what to do with new encounters. Incessantly exposing flaws can be pleasurable and can even become a source of belonging. We think this is at the heart of what destroys the transformative potential of movements from within. The capacity for paranoid reading closes off the capacity to embrace and be embraced by new things. The stance of detached judgment means remaining at a distance from what is taking place. In contrast, experimentation requires openness and vulnerability, including the risk of being caught off guard or hurt. From a paranoid perspective, things like gratitude, celebration, curiosity, and openness are naive at best and potentially dangerous. When everything is anticipated or one can see immediately how something is imperfect or lacking, one misses the capacity to be affected and moved. Holding ambivalence. Beyond mere happiness, what is being crushed by paranoid reading and lack finding is all the ambivalence and messy intensity of transformation. Walida Imarisha evokes this powerfully in her book, Angels with Dirty Faces, and when she shares the moment when she and other prison abolition organizers learned that Haramia, one of their imprisoned comrades, had had his death sentence commuted after a long struggle. Quote, the governor commuted his sentence. Haramia's campaign organizer smelled brighter than the sun beating down on us. It's the first time Perry ever did it. The Board of Pardons voted 6-1 to one for clemency. They haven't voted to stop an execution in 25 years. We did it. We won. Silence. Incredulousness. Too scared to believe. To hope. Then the explosion. Yelling. Hugging. Crying. They commuted Harami as sentence to life in prison. On an LA radio interview, I spoke of this victory. A, wom a woman called in. But he's still in prison for life. Isn't that a death sentence too? How can you call this a win? I paused. We won a battle in a larger war. We know that tomorrow we have to get up to continue. Tonight we celebrate. We celebrate that tomorrow Haramia will see another dawn. Today, today, today was a good day. We took over the prison yard, the supporters, sprawled out on the grass, screamed the good news in the cell phones, fell into each other's arms, laughing. Unable to give words to my feelings, I somersaulted across the prison lawn. It was the first time I ever felt I ever felt truly joyous in a prison yard, without a sense of dread and sadness nestled underneath. It was the only time I saw guards do absolutely nothing as we broke every prison conduct rule. Written and unwritten. We, they knew we won that day. I couldn't help but feel Hassan's presence, smiling his childlike grin, whispering softly, Yeah, Wawa, enjoy it now. Tomorrow we got a lot more work to do. End quote. Imarisha's story evokes the intensity of the, this moment, palpable even to the prison guards. It was 
enough to disrupt, if only for a few min moments, the brutal and arbitrary rules of the prison. The event punched a hole in the ultra-controlled space of the prison. Emerisha makes clear the importance of celebration, even as the ambivalence of the victory was obvious. Only from a perspective of, par of comparative evaluation and paranoid reading, it is possible to remind oneself and others that the key point to focus on what on is that Harami is still in prison or that the prison industrial complex is still intact. Only when viewed from a distance, without the investments and connections of those involved, could one think that this celebration is naive or unfounded. Emerisha spoke to this when he interviewed her, quote, In a society that fits everything into dichotomy, you win or you lose. There is no space for one that is attached to a loss. In the case of Haramiya Knesser, whose death sentence was commuted, it was an immense win to have that brother still with us. And other people were executed the same week by the, by the state of Texas. And his comrade Hassan Shakur, who was also my close companion, was executed almost a year before to the day. So for me, the win and loss of the situation was ever present, breathing together, and it's really hard to hold both of those. End quote. In Marisha's words reveal the capacity to hold on to intensity and ambivalence without parsing it into binary between feeling good and feeling bad, or, set a, or setting optimism against pessimism. To be capable of holding all of this, of one's attached to losses and joys attached to sorrows, is fundamentally about being affected. It's about inhabiting a world in of uncertainty and complexity about feeling and participating in, participating in emergent and collective powers. Joy. What all this makes clear to us is that there is no formula for a break with paranoid reading. There's only the discovery and renewal of ways of, of ways of moving and relating, right where we are in our own lives. To undo paranoid reading entails more than being nice or not alienating people. It can be about openness to new encounters and putting relationships before ideas. It requires challenging the corrosive tendency that impels us to find lack everywhere, to outmeasure, to outpreach, and to be on guard against the mistakes and the unexpected. It entails recovering the capacity to celebrate and to be surprised. The limits of critique from paranoia to potential. Radical and incisive critique is an indispensable weapon. In a world where we are enmeshed in forms of sub subjection, critique can support resistance and transformation. It can be a source of intimate reflection, unpacking things that are already sensed intuitively. By revealing that things have not always been this way and that they could be different, critique can create wiggle room for struggle. At the same time, when reduced to a habit, a reflex, or an end in itself, critique can become stifling and paranoid. And, we must admit, pointing to a paranoid reading and perfectionism can itself become a new form of paranoia, a critique of critique. These are the limits of critique. Critique can be helpful for asking how subtle dynamics manifest themselves, or for questioning inherited ways of doing things, but it doesn't necessarily activate capacities to be different with each other. For this reason, we want to emphasize the potential of affirmative theory as a complementary power that might help ward off paranoia. We talked to Silvia Federici about this, because we have been struck by the way she combines an incisive critique of Europe with an incredible generosity towards movements. Her approach is not about being positive all the time, but about the potential of struggle. Carla and Nick speaking. Another thing that we want to talk to you about is the style and tone of intellectual engagement. You have a really militant critique of capitalism, but you're always pointing to inspiring examples and a range of different movements, and you seem to reserve critique in terms of a really pointed attack for, a lar for large destructive institutions like the World Bank. So we wanted to ask, is this style something that you've cultivated and that, you've, and that you're intentional about? And maybe more generally, can you talk about the potential of theory and intellectual work today? What makes theory an enabling and transformative, and, what's the, and what gets in the way of that? Federici speaking. It's partially a consequence of growing old. You understand things that when you're younger you didn't see. One thing I've learned is to be more humble and hold my judgment of people until I know them beyond what I can make out from what they say. Realizing that people often say foolish things that they do not really believe or have not seriously thought about. It also comes from recognizing that we can change, which means that we should stress our potential rather than our limits. 
One of the most amazing experiences in the women's movement was to see how much we could grow, learning to speak in public, write poetry, make beautiful posters. All this has given me a strong distaste for the impulse to squash everything at the first sign that something is not right. I have made it a principle to not indulge in speech that is destructive. Striving to speak clearly, not to make people feel like fools because they don't understand what I say, is a good part of it. That's also something I've taken from the women's movement. So many times we had felt humiliated being in situations where we didn't understand what men had said and didn't have the courage to ask what they meant. I don't want to make other people ever feel this way. The notion of stressing potential rather than limit seems very important to us. But this is not just a shift in focus, but a whole different orientation. Limits are often spoken of as if they are fixed, and paranoid reading specializes in locating them and pointing them out. But limits are never fixed. Limits are always shifting edges of what we are, what we are capable of. To explore potential is to live right at these fluid edges. Affirmative reading is rooted in Spinoza's insight that we do not know in advance what a body or a movement or struggle can do. This ignorance is what makes experimentation possible. Potential is the dimension of these unfolding encounters that can never be known beforehand. To replace paranoid reading with affirmation is about activating a power complementary to critique, without giving up on critical thinking. Reading affirmatively and seeking out potentials can be a way for us to find new, new resonances and experiment with concepts in new ways. Critique as the questioning of inherited certainties and habits might be necessary to remove the obstacles to all this exploration. It might tear apart some of the rigidities that make experimentation difficult, but it can fall into a paranoid search for problems detached from the immediacy of life and the potential of new encounters. Maybe some paranoia is necessary, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't out to get you. Maybe it is a question of dosage and mixture, timing and framing, of combining critique and curiosity, wariness and exploration. We are not sure. Towards new encounters. Wherever they appear, common notions and transformative movements can fall prey to rigid radicalism. The shift can be subtle. What worked in a particular place and time can be converted into a fixed how-to list. A sense of experimentation and vitality can be sucked out of the air with a few words that induce a sense of paranoia and lack-finding. The shared capacity for encounters across difference can be converted into moral certainty and guilt-mongering. What was initially transformative in one context can be held up as the answer, a new duty, or a set of responsibilities that are imposed on others. This can even manifest as a rigid insistence on autonomy and individual freedom that crushes the potential for collective responsibility and action. Ethics and uncertainty cannot survive long in an atmosphere of stagnation and rigidity, detached from the transformative relationships that animate them. Common notions become fixed principles dropped on other people's heads. They remain enabling and ethical only insofar as they retain the capacity to activate responsibility. The capacity to ask over and over again what might move things here and now and to really take pause and listen to each other deeply. All of this is to say that ethical attunement, experimentation, and common notions are powerful, fragile, and precious. These sensibilities are already emerging in a lot of places as people figure out how to sustain and defend joy against the crushing tendencies of both empire and rigid radicalism. Paranoid reading, moralism, and ideology aren't going anywhere, and even naming and criticizing them can be ways of slipping into their poisonous grip, giving one a sense of superiority, of being above all those things. The critique of rigid radicalism can manifest as a new way of finding mistakes, or as contempt for places and people including oneself, where rigid radicalism takes hold. It can become a paranoid critique of paranoia itself. Criticism might be helpful to get a little distance from stifling and hurtful dynamics, or in figuring out how they work, but it will not necessarily activate other ways of being. Critiques are no use unless they create openings for joy and experimentation and for feelings and acting differently. For us, the best way to do this analytically has been to affirm that openings are always happening, are already happening and always have been, and that it is worth being grateful for these powerful legacies. In our own experience, and in talking with others, becoming otherwise is never a linear passage from one way of being to another, but instead a slow, uneven, messy process. Sometimes something new emerges only in the wreckage after groups have torn each other apart, or have people, burn, or have people burned out. 
Sometimes the flight from paranoid reading flips over into an everything is awesome attitude that refuses all forms of, forms of discernment and critique. Sometimes people sense that things are not working, find bits of joy, but then the rigid radicalism takes over again in another guise. Sometimes a dramatic event leads to new common notions and joyful ways of relating, and rigid radicalism loses its grip. Sometimes people abandon rigid radicalism in favor of an attempt to live a normal life under empire. Sometimes people travel, and their encounters leave them changed, or capable of cultivating collective power and experimentation. There is no blueprint, no map for moving in other ways. In telling these stories, we have tried to avoid generating prescriptions for others, and we hope to have made space for a proliferation of other stories about rigid radicalism, especially those about how and where people have been able to undo it or relate differently. New potentials can be activated by continuing these conversations with each other. Ultimately, we think, what is at stake in undoing rigid radicalism is joyful transformation, a proliferation of forms of life that cannot be governed by empire or stifled by rigid radicalism. To be militant about this is to nurture and defend those shared powers that grow through people's capacities to tune in to their own situations, to remain open experimental, and to recover and invent enabling forms of combat and intimacy.